Internuclear ophthalmoplegia, or INO, is a neurological syndrome affecting lateral conjugate gaze, often causing double or blurry vision. And it looks like this. You can see this gentleman has a right internuclear ophthalmoplegia. As he looks to the right, the eyes move together and he has no symptoms. But when he looks to the left, the left eye moves normally. It abducts, looking at the ear on the same side. But the right eye fails to adduct, in other words, look towards the nose so he experiences double vision. It's also possible to have bilateral INO, in other words, on both sides, as with this woman who has a disconjugate gaze whether she looks to the right or the left. So what exactly is INO? Well, we'll break down the term internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Plesia means paralysis, ophthalmo means of the eye, and internuclear means between two nuclei, in this case, the sixth and third cranial nuclei of the brainstem. And it's amazing that our brain naturally maintains conjugate gaze. When I look to the right and look to the left, my eyes stay perfectly aligned without me even thinking about it. Let's look at the anatomy of how that occurs. So let's take a look at this diagram showing the anatomy of the brainstem and selecting selected cranial nerve nuclei along with the eyes and some of the extraocular muscles. You can see the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain. And these are the eyes and the extraocular muscles that move them. So let's say that I want to look to the left side. What exactly is happening? Well, my brain sends a signal to the sixth cranial nerve nucleus, a bundle of neurons that are involved in lateral eye movements. This is also known as the abducens nucleus. And this sends a signal through the abducens, or sixth cranial nerve, which synapse on the lateral rectus muscle, and my left eye is pulled towards the left. However, at the exact same time, a signal is sent through this other bundle of nerve fibers called the MLF, or medial longitudinal fasciculus. And it's medial, in other words, close to the midline. It's longitudinal, a long strand of nerve fibers within the brain. And it's a fasciculus, or fascicle, or bundle of nerves. This synapses on the oculomotor nucleus, or the third cranial no nucleus, on the opposite side of the brain, now the right side. And nerve fibers are sent through the oculomotor nerve, which synapse on a different extraocular muscle called the medial rectus, and this pulls my right eye to look to the left, and hence my eyes move in concert. So what causes an INO? It's caused by injury to this bundle of nerve fibers, the MLF, or medial longitudinal fasciculus, on the same side of the disorder. So if the injury is on the right side, I won't be able to move my right eye to look left, and I'll have a right internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And of course, the same thing for the left side. If the MLF is injured on the left, my left eye will not be able to look to the right, and I'll have a left internuclear ophthalmoplegia. And you can imagine it, an injury around this this area near the midline could cause a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia because it injures both MLFs. And next we move to the causes of INO, and I'll show you some case reports and their accompanying MRI scans. But first, to speak in generalities, one of the most common causes of INO is demyelinating disease or inflammatory disease of the central nervous system, especially multiple sclerosis. It turns out the medial longitudinal fasciculus is heavily myelinated and susceptible to these types of diseases. When this is the cause, the symptoms tend to be more gradual in onset. They may be bilateral, and they may improve spontaneously or with steroids over time. Multiple sclerosis is by far the most common of such diseases. Some rarer diseases in this category that have been associated with INO include brainstem encephalitis, lupus cerebritis, and Bichette's disease. When INO develops suddenly, especially in an older person with known vascular risk factors like hypertension and type 2 diabetes, it's more likely to be caused by a stroke, especially of the superior cerebellar artery and basilar artery. And it can occur in isolation, but usually we see INO plus other neurological symptoms such as vertigo or weakness and numbness of one side of the body. There are also some rare causes of internuclear ophthalmoplegia. For instance, it's been reported with certain infections 
infections like cryptococcus meningitis, a fungal infection of the brain. It's been seen in certain forms of head trauma or with genetic and metabolic diseases or with certain types of drugs, toxins, or radiation exposure. So to show a few examples, this is an MRI scan of someone who developed a sudden onset right intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. They had no other neurological deficits, but the MRI scan shows a tiny stroke in the right back of the pons, exactly in the area of the right medial longitudinal fasciculus. In this next example, a 40-year-old man developed sudden onset blurry vision and was found to have a left INO, and this time MRI scan revealed an infarct in the posterior left midbrain, so a little bit higher up along that medial longitudinal fasciculus tract in the midbrain. And I should mention these stroke examples are atypical in that usually the stroke is a little bit larger and other neurological deficits are present. In this next example, we have a 15-year-old girl who developed blurry vision, and she had a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia, in other words, present on both sides. MRI of her brain revealed a lesion in the dorsal pons affecting both MLFs, which is why it was bilateral. And it also showed other lesions in the brain highly typical of the disease she has, which is multiple sclerosis. This next one is actually demyelinating disease as a side effect of the drug Etanercept, which is a TNF-alpha blocking agent well known to be associated with demyelinating disease. If you want more information on medications that can cause demyelinating disease and multiple sclerosis, take a look at this video. Anyways, this is a 46-year-old man taking Etanercept for psoriatic arthritis who developed double vision over five days and was found to have bilateral eye MRI revealed a lesion in the dorsal pons affecting both MLFs as shown here. In this next unfortunate story, this is an individual with very severe depression who was refusing to eat and was losing weight and then started developing neurological symptoms including double vision and other symptoms. Their MRI scan showed lesions in the dorsal midbrain and thalamus and it turned out they had thiamine deficiency, deficiency of vitamin B1 known to cause this neurological disease called Wernicke's encephalopathy, most associated with alcoholics who have a very poor and limited diet. This next one is an MRI of someone known to have metastatic squamous cell carcinoma who developed a bilateral INO, and unfortunately MRI of the brain revealed extensive metastases, including a mass near the fourth ventricle affecting the pons and midbrain causing the symptoms. This next one is an MRI of the brain showing a cavernous malformation of the pons. This is a vascular malformation. They are often benign incidental findings, but they can sometimes bleed. You can see the dark ring causing a popcorn lesion in the pons and sometimes cause neurological symptoms. This next one is a congenital malformation. You see an MRI of a four-year-old boy who has a history of a repaired myelomeningocele, in other words, spina bifida, and this MRI shows findings typical of Arnold Chiari II malformation with a lipoma. You can see it's bright on T1 at the quadrigeminal cistern, compressing the pons and midbrain, causing a bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So next I want to move to a few miscellaneous topics related to internuclear ophthalmoplegia. The first is so-called one-and-a-half syndrome, where you have a lesion in the brainstem that affects both the parapontine reticular formation, the PPRF, and the MLF, or medial longitudinal fasciculus. So the PPRF allows you to move your eyes to the same side. So the right PPRF initiates right eye movements. And when it's injured, you cannot look to the right at all. So you have total paralysis of gaze to the right. And so when you injure both, what happens is you cannot look to the right at all if the injury is on the right side. And when you look to the left, the left eye moves, but the right eye doesn't. Hence, you have a total injury to one side, the one, and then a partial injury to the other side, the one half, hence one and a half syndrome. And this being, can be caused by many of the diseases I discussed a moment ago. Related to one and a half syndrome is so-called eight and a half syndrome. This is where you have one and a half syndrome, but you also have injury to the seventh cranial nucleus, the facial nucleus, and you have paralysis on one side of the face on the same side as the injury. So for instance, you could have a facial paralysis that looks like this, where I have weakness of the right upper and lower face. As an aside, I'm only kind of faking that because I coincidentally have Bell's palsy on the right side. But you have that plus one and a half syndrome 
syndrome. So seven plus one and a half is eight and a half, hence the name eight and a half syndrome. And this is most commonly caused by a pontine stroke. One interesting thing is that for people who have bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia, sometimes the location of the lesion can be determined based on physical exam. The reason for this is there's a separate area of the brain that allows for convergence of the eyes. So when I look at something close, my eyes move together. And it turns out this medial movement of the eye is not actually determined by the third or sixth cranial nuclei. It's determined by a separate area called the convergence center, which is actually higher up in the brain at the junction between the midbrain and the thalamus. Hence, if I have an injury at the midline in the pons, I would have bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia, but my convergence would be normal. But if it's higher up, I may have abnormal convergence, and you can get this syndrome known as webino, or wall-eyed bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia, also known as exotropic bilateral internuclear ophthalmoplegia. I don't know how useful this is because you're likely going to get an MRI of the brain anyway to determine what and where the lesion is, but it's definitely an interesting neuroanatomical phenomenon. And the last thing I want you to understand is this idea of a pseudo internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So imagine you have double vision and you have exam findings that look typical of an INO and you go and do an MRI scan and it's normal. So what happened? Well, it's possible it's caused by a peripheral nervous system disorder, such as a neuromuscular junction disorder or a peripheral nerve disorder, and it's not an INO. Of course, if it's not an internuclear problem involving the medial longitudinal fasciculus, even if the symptoms are the same, it's not technically an INO. Some classic examples are myasthenia gravis, which is a neuromuscular junction disorder that causes eye fatigue and weakness. And with this disease, often the symptoms will be a little bit different, like maybe in the morning when the individual is well rested, the INO wouldn't be present and would only come out when the person is tired and there would be other symptoms. And this can also happen with diseases such as Miller-Fisher variant, acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, a variant of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And usually you can have bilateral ophthalmoplegia, but usually there are other findings such as having numbness or ataxia or clumsiness of gait and decreased reflexes or other findings. So just be aware of that idea that other diseases can sometimes cause similar findings, but they're not true internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Please ask comments or questions below. And for people who normally watch my videos for multiple sclerosis comments, content, I'd be interested to know, do you like this kind of topic or is it too technical or scientific? Some feedback would be appreciated.